Hello and welcome to In Our Community. I'm Vidya Pradhan. In this segment, we're featuring an organization called Vibha, a non-profit that serves the needs of underprivileged children all over the world. With me in the studio today are two volunteers from Vibha. So let's meet them. My first guest is Surya Rajagopalan. He is a coordinator for Vibha's Bay Area Action Center and he oversees the activities of Vibha in the Bay Area. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Surya. My next guest is Jasneet Anand. She is the Bay Area Center Coordinator for the Vibha Youth Chapter. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, welcome to the show, Jasneet. Thanks, Pradeya. Surya, why don't you start us off by telling us what Vibha is all about, starting with the name. Sure. Um, Vibha in Sanskrit uh, means inner radiance or brightness. And we often use it in the context of underprivileged children. So uh, we are a volunteer-run, US-based, non-profit organization. Um, so what we do is we are we act as a we work as a social venture catalyst mm -hmm. um, that work um, we work towards enhancing the education opportunities, economic opportunities, health health conditions of underprivileged children in India and the U.S. I see. So um, it's run entirely by volunteers. So what I get from you is it's a volunteer-driven organization that yes. acts as a social catalyst. Just social venture catalyst. Yes. Social venture cap catalyst. Catalyst. And just need um, that. Sounds a little different from what other nonprofits do in the Indian space. A lot of them are involved with setting up schools and hospitals, but that's not what Vibha does. So tell no, us how that, you're different. Yeah, that's correct. Vibha doesn't. Vibha, the whole idea about Vibha is we do not try to set up any system on any or or any organization that's parallel to something that's already set up. For example, uh, I'll I'll take a simple example for that. For example, uh, there are places where there are schools where the school the children are not performing that well. That doesn't mean that the school is not good what that means is there's a there's a school that the government is sponsoring but that might mean that there is not enough expertise in the school or there are not enough facilities in the school and that's why the children are not performing well so Vibha goes ahead and tries to find the projects similar to these and we go through a very big selection process but we try to provide funding and expertise to these project to these schools so that they can come up with uh, good performing students so we're not trying to set any Anything parallel to whatever is already existing we're trying to fund what is already existing and help them move forward so that's why we are a catalyst mm -hmm. to for them towards their growth so you take something that may be underperforming or not performing at all and you find what you need to do to make it work and you find the people who can make it work and you support them correct that, that is right yeah so we provide expertise we provide funds we provide training and uh, for them to move forward so Let's, I think the best way for our viewers to understand what you do is to show them an example or give them an example of what you do. So can you tell us about a project in India that Vibha has supported? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we have a project that has been running for a while. And uh, again, it's a, it's a project from an organization that already exists. It's called the Doorstep School, which is an excellent concept. It, it was made for construction workers out there in Pune, Maharashtra, India, where the construction workers are actually moving from place to place depending upon where they are actually working and so their children uh, unfortunately cannot go to any formal school because their parents are moving all the time so instead of taking the children having the children go to schools we actually take the school to the children and so the doorstep school is a concept where they have books and uh, teachers and all the equipment that's required for the school in the vans which goes to the construction sites and we have two types of projects that work there one is for the primary school kids where they we teach them about color basic things about color and shapes and stuff like that and then there's an elementary type of education where we teach them about numbers and facts so that when these construction workers eventually move to city or places where the kids can go where their children can go to actual formal school they don't have to bridge they don't have to bridge the gap they can actually go to their age appropriate classes so that they can just go ahead with a formal education mm -hmm. so that's one of the pr many projects that we fund where we are actually moving towards we are actually funding an organization that's already working and we're f funding them with our own with our funds and expertise so doorstep school existed correct and then you identified doorstep school as a potential recipient of your funding because of the work they were doing and the way they were doing it correct did you also offer some expertise in how to do it 
or is it some, is it just a project you identified as primarily needing funding and that's what you provided to For them? doorstep school, we didn't have to identify how to do it because they had a process in, spa in place. We just had to provide the funding. But we do have other, organi other, other uh, similar projects where we had to provide expertise and we've done that. So uh, I think this would be a good time to maybe take a quick look at how you identified doorstep school in the first place. How did you find out about it? Uh, yeah, so the way we we get to all these projects is that we have a, we have actually Vibha is a totally volunteer driven so, uh, organization as Surya just mentioned, and we have two uh, uh, we have four social workers in India who are actually going ahead and identifying projects for us, and once we and so they come up with the projects and we we try to identify the projects or we try to select the projects based on their scalability and sustainability. Mm -hmm. So if we can scale the project and we can at some point of time take it to a point where it can become self sustainable we select those projects and once we've selected those projects we start funding it and then we go through a whole monitoring process and monitoring is open to anybody they don't have to be really a Vibha volunteer they can actually go monitor the process and come back and tell us it's not working guys you need to take funding off and we will go through that process so whatever we do is actually all public information which can be which is available on our website as to how much funding every project is getting and we go through a very rigorous monitoring process even after we've started funding so you could potentially have a contributor to Vibha also go to India if they happen to be on a visit and check it out and see if your project is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, we do encourage our volunteers to go whenever they go to India, probably just the nearby community or the nearby place. They can just stop for a couple, day or two. Um, they can inform us too. We can inform us too. We can we are going to arrange for their visit, and um, they can give written feedback. They can give verbal feedback. And every year, this project has to have to be reviewed because um, the projects get funding only once a year. So for the next year to qualify for funding, they have to go again go through go this through rigorous, a review process. Uh, right. But that's that's good to know. Yeah, I mean we we have reference checks. We have uh, our social workers pro uh, provide feedback. The the nearby press and the media coverage give us feedback. So it's like all over. So uh, one thing that's unique about Vibha is that you also fund projects in the U.S. Yes, we do. Which is unusual because India can sometimes be such uh, a, a place where there are so many needs and so many projects to be funded right. that the attention doesn't actually, but, but you do. And uh, first tell me about one such project and then maybe we can find out why you, you fund it. Yeah, sure. Um, so there is one in, um, one in Milwaukee called uh, HEP, Homeless Education Program. It's run by the Milwaukee Public Schools. So there are families which are homeless. Maybe they are in shelters. They are sharing the house with someone else, or maybe they don't have even have a place to stay. And uh, kids, what happens in those families is that they are not able to stick to a particular school. As the families find new shelters or move around, they just move the families. And so um, there are many cases of kids where they discontinue education because they don't they are not able to stick to a school. Mm -hmm. And even if they go to the school, they don't have proper school supplies. Um, even if the maybe the, the family is in such a uh, hunger state that they don't even care about education for the kids. Okay. So they can get in touch with the Milwaukee Public School uh, HEP coordinator. So um, they just explain the rights to them. They provide them f uh, free food for the kids. They provide them with school supplies. They explain them the kind of school fee waivers that they're eligible for. What an amazing synchronicity that, that the two projects you're telling me about are both to do with displaced children. And right. one is in India and one is amazingly enough in the United States which you wouldn't assume because you think this is a developed country and kids should be doing better here. Yeah, we have but similar one similar in Bay Area project. too. Okay, tell me about the one in the Bay Area. Yeah, that's called uh, My New Red Shoes. My New Red Shoes. My New Red Shoes. Mm -hmm. um, so amazingly in the Bay Area there are um, close to 200,000 uh, low income or homeless children of, of, from homeless families. So My New Red Shoes is a non-profit that kind of uh, go and find from community schools or shelters or other from, from, uh, local foundations about these kids. And the first day they go to school, many kids don't want to go to school the, uh, from homeless or low income because they have ill-fitting shirts, they have ill-fitting shoes, they don't have proper school supplies, they are not dressed the way the other kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, they don't have the confidence and some people get laughed at, they don't want to go to school. So my new rituals kind of uh, puts a bag together, giving them a gift card to buy the, uh, some clothes, gives them a new pair of shoes and a school supply and then make them feel confident when they go to school. And you support this organization? Yes, we do. Vibha supports this organization. Yes. 
And talking of children, Vibha has another unique thing going for it, which is its youth chapter. Correct. That's right. And tell us uh, what makes it special and tell us the breadth of the chapter and what it does. So, um, as, as you might know, or our viewers might know that US does mandate that all the high school, middle school kids should volunteer give back community giving, which is great because they are actually volunteering, giving back to the community. So uh, the youth here are actually going ahead and doing a lot of work for volunteer hours. They are they're going to various organizations and doing various things just to get volunteer hours. Vibha created this uh, youth chapter so we can let them volunteer with the organization and feel the empathy that they should for the, uh, for the community that they live in or the community back home uh, in India. But then at the same time, we want to offer to the youth a uh, little bit of skills that they can use as for the career development too. Mm -hmm. So that the volunteer, so that our youth volunteers are not just going there for volunteer work, they can come back with some leadership kind of qualities or teamwork or spirit or, or uh, giving back. So uh, the youth volunteers totally based upon that principle. What we do is we have a set of, uh, we, have, we have a set of youth. Right now we have about 20 uh, active volunteers and more, are, more want to join us. We let the youth decide what they want to do and how they want to do fundraising. Now this could be something as simple as a book sale, bake sale, or this could be something a little bit more complicated like a table tennis match. Why don't you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, so the table tennis match was a brilliant concept which was actually a brainchild of one of our uh, youth volunteer who was a high school student. He's now in college, so very well settled now. But he was, he, we, we, we sat, we were in a, in a monthly meeting, we have a meeting every month, and we said, okay, what can we do to raise funds? And he said, we are, oh, I play table tennis, but we never have all these table tennis matches. The only ones we have are where people are care, care about their ratings. So let's have a friendly table tennis match. And we said, you know what, go ahead with it. Let's get you started. We will give you the tools and we will give you the expertise to go ahead and organize this event. So the entire event was literally organized by the youth, the marketing material, the publicity, the Facebook updates, the registration page definitely was created by us because it involves money, but the registration counts were all done by the, by the, by the youth. And then the post follow up, so what the, the youth went back with was an experience on how to create this whole event and how to, uh, how to be a leader, how to be a marketing lead, how to be a sponsorship lead, how to be uh, 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 an event lead and get that experience and at the same time raise the funds for the community. So primarily uh, the, the objective of the organization in the US is fundraising, isn't it? Fundraising, Broadly. monitoring the projects Monit there. It's a of project course, call yes. that goes on every Friday where people get together and discuss about the projects. So we have a couple of minutes, so I want to, I know you have, there's a lot of information to share. Uh, so I want to, you guys to talk about, uh, talk a little bit about how people who are listening to this show or watching this show can contribute to Vibha and participate in Vibha's activities. But I know you have a very cool initiative called Change for Children. So why yeah, don't we so, talk about that a little right. bit? So I want to show this uh, the box, this is called the Change for Children box. It's a very simple, simple money box, like a piggy bank. And what we have is we distribute that to anybody who would want to be involved with Vibha. You keep it on your countertop, keep it in your car, or keep it, we also put it in restaurants and uh, shops, and you just put your petty change in it. And surprisingly enough, it gives us a lot of revenue. Uh, in 2012, out of Breda, we almost had a $3,500 uh, revenue just from change from general, just those pennies that nobody even cares about. And that was a very few boxes, right? There were very few boxes, and, and we are getting a lot more boxes this year. And remember, e every penny is a lot of money back there in India. Can I have that one for myself? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that is going to be my change for children box. Right. And I can see I have loose change all over the place, under sofa cushions, on tables. You now know, you know what my, to do with that. Now you know what now to do. Now you know what to do. <laughs> exactly. And, and there are other ways. wonderful for yeah. this to go to a good so cause. Talk about that? So tell us, how, what are the other ways that we can contribute? And remember, we have just a minute or so to go. Sure. Um, you can always donate money. You can get involved with us. So we have a meeting that goes on every Wednesday. We brainstorm about different programs. We have a Dream Mile program, which is called, which is a half, uh, half marathon, 5K, 10K run. That happens in the San Jose during the summer. There's a dance program called Dandia that happens during the October. Fall. Yeah. Uh, we are going to get you back, guys back in the studio next year to talk about your fascinating events because I know they make a big stir in the community and they're open to everybody to join. Yes. Sure, drop us an email. Absolutely. So we're just about running out of time. So I want to take the opportunity to say a big thank you to Jasneet and Surya for being in the studio with me today. And for everybody who's watching the show, Change for Children, just ask for a box at vibha.org. Thanks for having us over there. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Thank Namaste. You. Aloha, adios, and goodbye from us. 
Yeah, happy volunteering. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, first thing we do is we try to find a comfortable place for you to sit, which may be in one of our own vehicles, or perhaps you have a neighbor who has been aroused by the uh, by all the commotion. Uh, but we find a comfortable place and we sit and talk to you and find out what your concerns are, you know, are you, are you missing a pet? Do you need your medications? Have you lost your cell phone or whatever? And just listen to you and then we try to help you as we can. Our primary ability to, to help you comes from donations which we receive from, from individuals which allow us to um, pay for hotel room for you if, mm. if you need that, if you don't have a okay. place to stay, we can provide you with a debit card so that you can purchase clothes to get you through uh, a two or three day mm -hmm. period, uh, money to buy meals, uh, and we help you replace any medications or oh. or eyeglasses or you know other uh, mm -hmm. you know medical uh, mm -hmm. supplies that that you have lost in the fire. Uh, we're not really there to to replace everything that you lost. We're there to to help you for two or three days while you gather your resources, talk to your insurance agent, you know, talk to your family and friends, find a new place to live or whatever. So we we help you through a two or three day period to at, at first have a warm place to stay, have clothes to wear, food to eat, and then help you put your life mm -hmm. back together because this is for an individual this is a disaster <laughs> absolutely that's my house behind me remember. that's a disaster yes so it sounds like there must be a lot of money involved if I, you read about fires all the time if you're putting people up in hotels and so forth where does that money come from uh, that money is all uh, private you know donations from individuals uh, so Red the Cross Red Cross is not funded by the government Red Cross is, receives we, we work with with the government on big disasters and of course we're working with local fire department but none of the money that we spend to to help the we call them clients we try not to refer to them as victims that just compounds the problem uh, and so all of that all of the uh, the money that we spend to, to help people is from private donations okay. now something you didn't mention I have a dog Orion about this big does and he my bite house people? Burned down. Uh, not usually. Okay. Well, but. pets are something that people always should think about uh, before uh, before the something goes wrong. They can it can happen many times that, that for some reason you you need to have your your pet taken care of. The Red Cross has problems finding hotels which will allow you to bring in a pet, so that makes it hard for us to find a hotel and sometimes you'll have to travel a, a longer distance in order to stay in a hotel that will mm. will allow you to keep your pet with you if you have relatives or neighbors who would keep the pet for you that is one of the the better things to do mm -hmm. now on occasion we've had people who have pets who are not the typical cat or dog perhaps it's a uh, an aquarium with fish or with, with yeah, what do you do with that? You can't pick up your aquarium no, you and take can't. it to a hotel. Then we we try to work with the the fire department to see if that can be uh, either left in place and get it a you know get power to it or or whatever. But we do have you know people you know, they're already upset. They've had a had a disaster, and you need to realize that they're very concerned about their pets. So that is part of taking care of them is to take care of their pets. Although. We're not really set up to care for for pets. Mm -hmm. So you're talking right now about you know a house that burns down. In apartment buildings, do you typically wind up burning down the whole building and affecting lots of families, or what happens? Well, usually, a fire is restricted to one unit or perhaps uh, you know oh, okay. adjacent units. However, that doesn't mean that are, that we only have two clients because when the fire department comes out to to deal with the, the incident, be a fire, um, they have to shut down the utilities in the building in order to make it safe to to uh, uh, put out the fire. And once they've done that, they can't turn the utilities back on until they've determined that there are no hazardous situations that exist. So everyone in the building that is 
for which the utility system shut down, become a Red Cross client. They, of course, will probably be able to go back into their unit. Uh, if the fire was uh, in the middle of the day, they might be able to go back uh, that, uh, that evening after everything's been taken care of. If it's in the middle of the night, uh, they probably won't get back in until the next day. In that case, we, when we have a large number of people, of course, we can't find hotels for everyone. And given how hard it is to find a hotel nowadays for even one person uh, or one's family, uh, we really, it's very difficult to find enough open hotel rooms locally for a large group of people. In that case, we make arrangements to open a shelter. Now, in the case of the, uh, the hazardous material evacuation that we had to do here in Mountain View recently, uh, the city arranged uh, to have the rec center over at Ringsdorf available. And the Red Cross has, between the rec center and the senior center, we have a, a trailer in which we have supplies in which to open a shelter. Yeah. So in that case, that happened at, at supper time approximately. Mm -hmm. And so it was first what we call an evacuation shelter. We are not setting it up for people to stay overnight because we have to be flexible. We don't know whether they'll be able to get back in before bedtime or if they're going to be there overnight. So we don't set up the entire shelter as a, a residential shelter when we first start. We just start an evacuation shelter. But we also, given it was supper time, uh, we had to make sure they had they probably missed dinner uh, and so we have to make arrangements to have food. In that case, we ordered lots of pizza and we had snacks and, and water and other beverages available for them uh, at the rec center while the situation was resolved. Later in the evening, the fire department came back and said that no, they would not be able to get back into their uh, units that night. A number of people there had uh, already made contact with friends or neighbors or made their own arrangements for a place to stay uh, that evening. But we had about 20 or so people left over after that. So at that point, we then got out all the blankets and the cots and started to uh, set up the shelter so that people could stay overnight. Mm -hmm. At that point, we also, since we know they're staying overnight, we have to make arrangements for them to have breakfast. So we start that process. Okay. So you were telling me before the interview that actually the Red Cross responds to about three fires a week. That's a lot of fires and no disrespect, but I don't want you to have a reason to come to my house. So can you give me a few tips in our last 45 seconds or so about how to avoid having a fire at all? You can't avoid all fires. So, so you should make sure that your smoke detector and your carbon monoxide okay. detectors are working to okay. wake you up. Okay. I will go right home and do that. So thank you, Norm Barabee. We really appreciate your talking to us about what the Red Cross does with fires. This is Stephanie Charles from In Our Community. We hope you've enjoyed this program and join us again next time.